Toronto's podcast on the Canada's Podcast Network. Hi, I'm Celine Williams, international speaker, business strategist, and co-host for the Ontario podcast of Canada's Podcast. And I'm here at Collision Conference in Toronto with Gabe Musso, who is the Chief Sciences Officer of Biosymmetrics. Gabe is the, I'm gonna read your bio. Yeah, please. The Head of Life Sciences, as CSO and Head of Life Sciences for Biosymmetrics, he is expanding Biosymmetrics scientific leadership in their key healthcare and biomedical markets for their Augusta platform. Previously, he was the Associate Scientist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where his work focused on using machine learning frameworks to predict gene and small molecule function and identification of disease causal genes using large-scale gen genomic data sets. That's a lot of science words Rolls to off say. the tongue. Yeah. yeah, very easy yeah. to say. So tell me a little bit about Biosymmetrics and your journey to becoming the Chief Science Officer and an entrepreneur and joining this exciting world, especially coming from the, the world of hospitals. <laughs> yeah, I never recommend my path to anybody. It's kind <laughs> of a, uh, it's an uh, interesting story. So I, I was a postdoc for a long time. I was, I was working at Harvard Med School. I was, my project was coming along and then uh, for personal reasons, we moved back to Toronto, uh, which was fantastic. I love the city. I love being here. And so I started to look at, you know, what was available. There was this emerging startup scene that, you know, I had only been away from the city for about five years, but really was taking off. And it was fantastic. It was something that was hardly on my radar when I left in 2010. And when I came back in 2015, it was just palpable that there were, there were startups that were getting funding and being successful. And so it was really something that I wanted to take part in. And so... I started to work with a company called RTDS, which was the precursor to Biosymmetrics. They had this wonderful AI platform that had worked in other areas. They had actually, actually used it in mobile advertising. And so they were using it to like, customize um, uh, advertising on your mobile phone. And they wanted to find applications for it in the biomedical space. So they hired me and they said, we want you to go find a disease area, go cure a disease, go, go take our <laughs> software. Guys. No big deal. This Just go cure it like that. Yeah. Uh, so I said, uh, well, let me at least, uh, I'll see what we can do. And yeah. so I, I started working with autism data. And so we started to make uh, predictive models of autism. Mm. And we had access to MRIs and fMRIs. And we were looking to build a, a more objective classification of, of autistic patients. And what we quickly found was that we were spending so much time standardizing, normalizing, just getting the MRIs into a place where they could then be used by this, this AI engine. And so myself and a few others, we went to the board and we said, look, the AI engine is not the problem. The problem is we're spending so much time upstream and all these little decisions that we're making actually have a lot of consequence in terms of how well our models are gonna perform or how well they're gonna do when we try to apply them to new patient sets. And so this is the area that we should be focused on. And the board, thankfully, you know, uh, completely agreed with that. And so we created a company called Biosymmetrics. And we started to work on a software platform that could let us take you know, an MRI directly from device, combine it with tabular data, combine it with genomic data, combine it with chemical structures, medical history, and not only allow us to build these models that incorporate all of that information, but also allow us to have control over the whole process. So we can automate a lot of the upstream work, make it less manual, and make it more effective. And that's the nature of what we built. And so we're really excited to bring this to market. It's basically, it's a simplified biomedical syntax or biomedical language. Right. And so if you understand Augusta, all of the, you don't have to understand the 30 different software packages for all these individual data types, right. cloud computing, distributed computing, it's all handled uh, on the back end for you. And so that's what we're putting to market. Is it in market now or is it coming to market? It is coming to market. So we're in the beta stage now. Cool. And so we'll be available in the marketplaces soon. Has Biosymmetrics bootstrapped this to this point? Have you gotten funding to get here? I know the Canadian landscape is, is very different than the, the American, and we always hear about the American landscape when it comes to this. So It is unfortunately true, and there, there are certainly some key differences. Yeah, uh, We were fortunate in the fact that our board members did have an exit from another company. They were able to, to fund uh, one in particular. Anthony was able to fund the company uh, you know, uh, pr directly from the beginning, and so that gave us a lot of latitude. It was great. We just last year started to look at outside money. We did a friends and family round, so we went to uh, kind of smart investors, investors that could participate on our advisory board and that can make connections for us. And we are just now starting to look at VCs as well. That's a really intelligent way of approaching the, the funding. And, and I love that because I think a lot of companies and a lot of founders and our audience is a lot of entrepreneurs and founders, they immediately start thinking, how can I get VC funding? How can I jump into that? And yeah. it's not always the best first step. It's an interesting thing. I mean, so in my limited experience, I've seen a lot of businesses fall apart because they just took the wrong money. 
money. Yes. And so you get, like you said, I mean, it's such an opportunity when you get resources, you kind of jump at it. But if it's the wrong people or if it's the wrong insight, it really can can diminish things. As uh, willing as you might be to take it, yeah. you really do have to do the difficult thing and consider if it's the best thing for the company. 100%. And you know, there there is money out there. And yeah. so if you feel like you've got a great product and you have a vision, I mean, obviously, Investors add a lot more than resources. They add insight. They add, you know, they add a seat on the board in some cases. They can they can steer the direction of the company, and so you want to make sure that they have the same qualities that you do. What is you know being an entrepreneur in Toronto and running a business in Toronto? What are some of the upsides and downsides to that? Yeah, absolutely. So one the the kind of networking, the the academic scene, the startup scene is fantastic. So I, we did spend some time out in Silicon Valley. We were part of an accelerator program there, which was fantastic, called Plug and Play. And all, all we kept hearing about was how jealous they were of Toronto. When we talked to people that were from Silicon Valley, they were talking about how they kept hearing about the information corridor in Toronto, which Toronto and Waterloo. And there's always been this, this pool of talent in Toronto when it comes to machine learning. There's always been great advances when it comes to medicine. And so it's a natural kind of incubator for startups that are working in the biomedical space. Right. And so that that always has been fantastic. And I've loved the, the events, you know, TechTO, HealthTO, you know, those uh, events that are, are really seeking to, to get you know, entrepreneurs together with, with you know students and grad students it's been it's been wonderful as well Toronto being the fourth largest city in North America I feel like sometimes if you're from here you're not thinking oh there's so many networking events and all these things and then yeah. if you've lived anywhere else which I also have and you come back then you're like oh my gosh Toronto has a lot it's true you can, yeah in a way take it for granted and I certainly <laughs> I certainly did but I mean you're right it takes a bit of perspective and then you come back and you realize well this was maybe this was here the whole time and I just didn't know yeah. but there really are a lot of great resources not that this isn't the case elsewhere people are always willing to chat people are always willing to, to learn about what you do and to you know see if there's ways you can work together that is is kind of I don't want to say universal, but that's pretty common for startups, but I find more so in Toronto as well. I agree. Torontonians are very friendly. They're yeah. very friendly folks, i found. Yeah, absolutely. Growing up here, do you have places in the city or outside the city that you like to escape to, to reset or get some... Because it's also a big city, right? Like, it yeah. it's, can be hard to find perspective when you're in it every day. Yeah, I mean, I love to go up north. I mean, we, I love to go camping, uh, go to Algonquin. I love to go to, you know, the cottage area. Uh, we always do that. I guess that's a pretty common answer. I, it's all whatever works for you, and it's great that we have that ability. Absolutely. It's not too far away from the city. It's good, you know, you can go skiing close by, you can go be outdoorsy, which is nice, and then come back to the city. I wonder with that shift from sort of the academia and healthcare into what you're doing, which is applied, it's not that it's unrelated, but it's it's yeah. quite different a world from that to startup. Yeah. Has there been any um, advice that you've been given that really stands out as yeah. memorable? Two things that, that really stand out to yeah. me is, is when I started to have a lot of confidence, not that I didn't from the beginning, but when you kind of, when you're part of the initial stages of a company, you always have a vision, but it's easy to kind of uh, doubt it a little bit. What really helps is finding the right people. And so being surrounded by the right people really has helped uh, my experience. We have a very talented team. We have a very talented you know, uh, management. Our, our, our board is, is fantastic. And so that just gives you so much confidence to head into these meetings, to, to continue to develop the software, to go in day in, day out, and work the long hours. And so having the right people around you really does, I know it's kind of corny, but really does make all the difference in the world. The other thing that, that was eye-opening for me is I have you know friends of mine that were part of another company, I won't name and shame them, but <laughs> friends of mine that uh, were part of a company that did actually raise a lot of money. I was talking to them in the early stages, and one thing they said that stuck to me was sometimes you can have a profitable company that's not investable, or you can have an investable company that's not profitable. Yes. And that was such an eye-opener to me. I had always looked at it in a very conventional way where you know you you build a product, you bring it to market, you generate revenue, you get funding, you scale. And in the biotech space, there are a lot of very influential, very successful companies, I would say, that are still not revenue positive. Mm. And it's an interesting thing that there's still a model there to be successful and how you navigate that and how you have that conversation with investors is something I think to learn as well. I love that and I guarantee that's gonna be like one of the tweetables that comes out of this conversation because even if you think of things think of things like Twitter, which are very, it's a very investable company, but it was, I don't even know if it's profitable Absolutely. now, right? Like yes. lots of money in it, but it's not revenue generating or it yeah. wasn't for sure for a long time, so. The biggest kind of question mark you have is scaling and so how quickly yes. do we bring people on? How, how much do we use our resources? Yeah. When is it too fast? When is it too slow? 100%. And you never really 
know. And so it's the big companies, I think, are still going through this as well. Yeah. Because, you know, they are still in a phase of, of expanding. Absolutely. And so that certainly is so scary, though, when you're still not profitable. So I'm going to ask you a more personal question. Sure. As this product comes to market, as you step into this next world, what would you say are the top two or three things on your bucket list right now? I want to grow this to a $100 million company. I love it. That's on my bucket list yeah. for sure. I want to see everyone that works for the company get what they want out of it. Yeah. I want to see their careers develop you know, the way that they had hoped. I've had the opportunity, luckily, to be around Europe a little bit, but I'd like to spend a lot more time there. Yeah. I'd like to spend some more time in Italy, I'd like to spend some more time in France. And so if you're ready, I have a couple of rapid fire questions here for you. Okay. okay. So the first one is, if you weren't doing what you do now for work, what would you be doing instead? Probably would have kept up the road of being an academic. Yeah. So I, I probably would be, you know, hopefully running a lab somewhere. Um, so what book are you currently reading? And do you have a book that you would recommend to our audience? <laughs> My founder always gets me to read these, these books that are kind of relevant to what we're doing. I love it. I'm reading Blitzscaling right now, which is, which is quite good. Amazing. I read Bad Blood recently, which is an amazing story. If you haven't read it, I haven't. on Theranos, which okay. is a fantastic book as well. Uh, and uh, the other book that I'm reading right now is The Hard Thing About Hard Things. So all very kind of work-centric. Our audience is entrepreneurs. They're going to love this. You are speaking their language, so that's amazing. Excellent. If you had to pick one word to describe yourself, what would it be and why? Lucky. Uh, I, it's just I'm in such a fortunate position to do what I do. Yeah. And I feel that, you know, I feel that, that pride every day. That's amazing. Yeah. That's great. I love that. Um, what is keeping you up at night these days? When you run a startup, it's always stressful. There's always things that come up every day. There's panics, there's ups, there's, there's downs, there's, there's more downs, I would say, than ups <laughs> in, the, in the early stage. Uh, but what keeps me up at night is worrying about the people. Right. So making sure that, that they're happy, that, that they're not as stressed as I am, I guess it keeps me up at night. I love that. I'm very people focused and I work with organizations that are people focused. And I love that because we don't often talk about that as a piece of running a business. We get so focused on the profit or the product and really the people are the lifeblood of it. So I love that that's Absolutely. your starting point. Yeah, 100%. Like, that's really great. Yeah. What is your favorite place in the world and why? Can I say Toronto? Absolutely you can. Toronto. Toronto's fantastic. Yeah. Um, it's a great city, it's a great size city. There's so much going on, so much happening. So I really do love being in Toronto. What are three non-negotiables that have to happen sort of in your morning or evening routine if you have anything like that? So I have two children. I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old. I don't get to set any non-negotiables. <laughs> so they, I don't do any negotiating with them. They, right. they set the, they tell me what has to happen in right. the morning and the evening. I appreciate you sharing that because it's we don't always hear that perspective. People get really caught up in then this is the way it has to look for me to be successful. And the truth is that when you have kids or you have a, a lot of travel or whatever the case may be, those go out the window. They have to. Absolutely. So I love that you shared that because I think we don't talk about that often enough. Yeah. Okay, so the last question is, there's a small, beautiful tropical island in the middle of the ocean. There's no internet, there's no technology, there's just a phone booth. Okay. You get one phone call. You're dropped off on this island. How long do you think you would last before making that phone call to get off the island, and what would you do while you were there? Uh, I think I would probably spend the first two days just lying down, <laughs> <laughs> sleeping. And then after that, I would get sick of it. So I would, I would probably last maybe a day or two okay. before I you know, worry that the world is looking for me and yeah. I have to get back. <laughs> <laughs> the joy of running a startup is you're like, I need to get back. I have so many emails I'm going to have so to check when I get back. <laughs> That's totally fair. Well, Gabe, thank you so much for coming and, and speaking with me. I really appreciate it. It's a lot it. of fun. And to our listeners and our audience, thank you for being with us. I invite you to check us out at www.canadaspodcast.com where you can listen, discover, and engage.